Hello, film historians. I'm Derek, and I love old movies. We've got Sam the sidekick here. Hello, and welcome to episode 46. We really keep churning them out, don't we? Oh, and how. Welcome back to the show, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Last week, of course, Sam was unavailable, and Nikki filled in as guest host. And honestly, for a film that we didn't think many people would have a lot of interest in, it wound up becoming our third best week of release episode of all time. I did not expect that for Dark City. No, me neither. It's already our 10th most listened to episode ever. That's uncanny. It is. But now you're back in the sidekick chair and we are wrapping up our look at film noir in the month of June with the 1946 crime drama, The Blue Dahlia. A bit of a curious film here. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say right off the bat that it's not what I was expecting. I know what you mean, but there is a lot to discuss here. Well, should we take care of business and get down to things? Obviously we should. So business number one, thanks for being here. Yep. Thanks for listening. Yeah. We love watching these films and chatting about them for you. It's a lot of fun. Totally true. And you know what? We, we love hearing from you as well. So if you've ever got ideas or suggestions for us, maybe you just want to talk about movies with us. Get in touch. Let us know. Also, if you'd like to read a cold open for the podcast, oh, yeah. maybe talking about a nostalgic or formative experience you had watching movies, get in touch and let's make that happen right away. You don't even have to have come from a small town in the Ottawa Valley. But bonus points if you did. And if you could, right now, please take a moment to hit like, subscribe, and share. Especially share. The sharing is the big one. Or if you're on an audio-only platform, say Spotify or Apple Podcasts, see about dropping us some stars and maybe even a quick review. You'd be surprised how much that sort of thing really helps. And then, if you're looking for something fun to do this weekend while you're sitting on the deck enjoying the weather, why not check us out on the socials? Why not indeed? After all, we are on the Facebook. I love old movies. The podcast. La Instagram. At I Love Old Movies, the podcast. El Twitter. At ILOM Podcast. And the good old fashioned email. I Love Old Movies, the podcast at gmail.com. All one word. <laughs> and of course, you can always do what the cool kids do, and that is pet the rock. By that, we mean head on over to petrockradio.ca and listen to amazing local web based radio programming with fantastic music and. Previous episodes of our show broadcast twice a week. Monday and Saturday. Come for the music, stay for the podcasts. We'll link that for you in the description. So, are you all set to go on the run from the police and the mob wanted for a murder you didn't commit? Well, when you put it like that, of course yes. <laughs> then let's get on with things. Hit the music. Our director today is George Marshall. Marshall got his start in the film industry working as an extra at Universal, doing stunt work for Westerns, and he appeared in The Waiter's Ball as far back as 1916. He quickly realized that he didn't enjoy acting and decided to try his hand at writing and directing. His first film was The Committee on Credentials from 1916, and he worked on a few more two real Westerns later that year with actor Ruth Rowland. In the 20s, Marshall worked with a few more big names, such as Tom Mix, and even collaborated with Max Sennett. He also supervised all the comedic output from Fox between 1925 and 1930. At the introduction of the sound era in Hollywood, Marshall worked on many films in a wide variety of genres, such as Strictly Unreliable, Destry Rides Again, You Can't Cheat an Honest Man, and The Blue Dahlia. Through the 50s and 60s, Marshall worked as a freelancer, turning out many movies, including three big films for Glenn Ford, The Sheepman from 58, The Gazebo from 59, and Advance to the Rear in 1964. In his later years, Marshall did some work for a couple TV series, including Here's Lucy from 1969. He ended his career with more than 180 directorial credits. Retiring from filmmaking in 1972, Marshall died just a few years later in 1975 at the age of 83. The writer is Raymond Chandler. American-British novelist and screenwriter, Chandler got his start as a writer in 1932 as a detective fiction writer. His first short story, Blackmailers Don't Shoot, was published the following year, and his first novel, The Big Sleep, was published in 1939. While the majority of his career focused on novels, 
Chandler's literary successes, many of which were adapted into films, led to his work in Hollywood. His first screenplay not adapted from a novel, which was co-written by Billy Wilder, was Double Indemnity in 1944. Through the 40s and 50s, he collaborated on various productions, very few of which were regular films. Chandler worked on several book-to-movie adaptations, such as Lady in the Lake, 1946, as well as quite a few TV series, such as Climax. Of the films he worked on, Chandler was nominated for an Academy Award twice, for The Blue Dahlia in 1946 and Double Indemnity. Ending his career with 40 writing credits, Chandler passed away in 1959 at the age of 70. Of all the big-name actors that dominated the landscape of old Hollywood, none may be as under the radar from today's point of view as Alan Ladd. A completely atypical leading man, Ladd had good but nondescript looks, an acting style that offered very little emotion, and very short stature. So much so that he and filmmakers went to great lengths to conceal this. Ladd was quite an achiever in high school, starring on the swim and dive teams, as well as playing the lead in a school production of The Mikado. He was discovered by a scout and signed to a contract with Universal, but his shortness and blondness led to him being dropped. Voice and acting training followed, and Ladd worked in radio, considered a perfect talent for that medium. But he had gotten no closer to being in movies. And that changed when he was brought in by Agent Sue Carroll, and that was a huge difference maker for him. While he wasn't cast in Golden Boy, that role went to William Holden, he did appear in small roles in a few films, including an uncredited appearance in Citizen Kane. The film Joan of Paris led to him getting a contract offer from RKO, but even a more lucrative one from Paramount. So what happened? What took him from an eight-year quest to make it in the movies to suddenly getting signed? Well, according to author David Thompson in 1975, he wrote, Once Ladd had acquired an unsmiling hardness, he was transformed from an extra to a phenomenon. Ladd's calm, slender ferocity make it clear that he was the first American actor to show the killer as a cold angel. Well, Ladd's career took off at that point, as the film A Gun for Sale catapulted both him and his on-screen pairing with Veronica Lake into stardom. Ladd made a few more films before being inducted into the army, and there he was declared 4F and mustered back out. Now, Paramount was concerned that he would have to re-enlist, and they made some films very quickly with him to capitalize on his popularity and star power, and this led to some rushed productions, notably The Blue Dahlia. By the immediate post-war era, Ladd was a top 10 Hollywood star in terms of his paycheck and the popularity of his films. He still wasn't appearing in big movies, however. But when he appeared in The Great Gatsby, amid reluctance based on his skill level, the film was a flop, critically and commercially, and Ladd didn't pursue serious dramatic roles after that, preferring to stay in his wheelhouse of stoic, cool-as-ice tough guys. His contract with Paramount ended in the early 50s, over money, predictably, but one of the final films he made there truly cemented his position as a screen icon, 1953's Shane. Arguably the highest point of his film career, the movie about a cowboy protecting a family was exactly the vehicle he'd always needed. Ladd made films through the 1950s and formed two of his own production companies, the most successful being Jaguar, which distributed films made through Warner Brothers. He produced and starred in many films during this time, but the returns became increasingly diminished, and the movies weren't doing as well financially or critically. By the 1960s, he was more interested in producing and developing projects, and was even looking for a project that he and Veronica Lake and William Bendix could all work together on again. An odd accident involving a pistol led to Ladd shooting himself in the chest in 1962, and a more tragic accident led to him overdosing on a cocktail of alcohol and sleeping medication in 1963. The biggest little man in old Hollywood, Alan Ladd passed away in 1964 at the age of 50. There are some actors from the old Hollywood era that you just assume made a ton of movies over a very long span of time because they're so famous and even iconic. But when you take a close look at the career of Veronica Lake, you might be surprised how much she fit in in a very short span of time. 
Although she had made a few nondescript films in nondescript roles under her birth name at the beginning of her career, it was with 1941's I Wanted Wings where her stardom really took off. It was a bigger role with lines, and her new screen name and influential and trend-setting trademark hairstyle all combined to wow audiences, and she was considered to be the find of the year. Not bad for a girl who hadn't hit 20 yet. Lake made two more films for Paramount in 1941 before getting her first starring lead role in This Gun for Hire the following year. Although Robert Preston was the male lead in that film, Lake was paired on screen with Alan Ladd, and their incredible screen chemistry led Paramount to cast them together several more times. Lake made many films in succession in the early 1940s, but a growing reputation as being very difficult to work with left her with a wake of actors like Joel McCree, writers like Raymond Chandler, and directors who did not want to work with her. Bouts of depression, alcoholism, and personal tragedies such as divorce and the loss of her first child did not help things. The Blue Dahlia was a fairly late career film for her, despite being released in 1946, and it was likely her last hit. Subsequent films didn't enhance her star value, and by 1951, she was out of the movies, out of Hollywood, and turned up doing sporadic television and stage appearances, while also working as a waitress and dealing with massive tax bills, estrangement from her children, and increasingly problematic alcoholism. Her final project, which she helped finance, was 1970's Flesh Feast. It was not a hit. A true Hollywood it girl in her day, forever remembered for her trademark peekaboo hairstyle and the tragedies of her personal life, Veronica Lake died of complications from alcoholism in 1973 at the age of 50. Definitely the most interesting story behind the production of The Blue Dahlia has to do with its writer, Raymond Chandler. Chandler had been working on a manuscript for a novel, but was stalled creatively. He showed what he had to producer John Hausman, who commissioned it as a script and made arrangements to start filming almost immediately. This was Chandler's first original screenplay, which was exciting for him, but it wasn't finished. So finish it. He's a writer. Bingo, bango, done. Not so much. Chandler struggled to get the rest of the script out, and with the film crew consuming pages faster than he could write them, this was a problem. And worse, when he was nearing completion, the entire ending had to be scrapped. What? Why? Well, in Chandler's version, Buzz was the killer. But the U.S. Navy did not like the idea of a former serviceman character with shell shock and a brain injury being portrayed as a murderer under any circumstances. Almost like they didn't want people thinking that going to war could affect someone in terrible ways. Right. So Chandler had to write an ending that satisfied the Navy, the studio, and himself. And what did he do? Well, he got writer's block. Oof. So the studio offered him a $5,000 cash bonus for completing the script. That didn't work. But Chandler must have sensed an opportunity, because he went on to negotiate a honey of a deal in order to finish the script. Better than $5,000 of 1946 money? Well, he got to work from home instead of at the studio. That was unheard of at the time. But he would also require a permanent connection phone line directly to the studio. And of course two limousines at his disposal. What? Why two? Well, one was to drive pages to the studio, and one was for his wife to tool around in and be chauffeured everywhere. (laughs) That's excellent. Meanwhile, Chandler sat around at home getting drunk, turning out pages as best he could manage. All those perks and the ending we got, man. (laughs) Don't drink and write, kids. The film did well, though, right? It did great in the box office, both in the U.S. and Britain, and it was very well-reviewed. It was a hit, plain and simple. Hmm. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, what's the tale of the tape on this one, Sam? So, we have a 7.1 on IMDb. Hmm. The audience score is 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. Right. And the tomato meter is 100%. The film was nominated for an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, and it can be rented on Amazon Prime Video.
Three Navy airmen return stateside to their home in Los Angeles. Johnny is looking forward to seeing his wife. George wants to find an apartment. And Buzz has a metal plate in his head and is dealing with PTSD that seems to be especially triggered by listening to music. Johnny heads to his wife's bungalow where she's hosting a wild drunken party. It becomes pretty clear immediately that she's having an affair with Eddie Harwood, the owner of the Blue Dahlia nightclub, and a shifty dude in his own right. Johnny punches him right in the face, and the party kind of wraps up. The mood killed. Helen, the wife, she isn't all that glad to see Johnny back home, and she tells him that their son is dead due to a car accident she caused while driving drunk. He roughs her up a bit and pulls a gun on her. This is witnessed by the hotel detective, sort of the security guy for the bungalow community, Dad Newell. But Johnny drops the gun and walks out on Helen, intending to go see George and Buzz. Now, poor simple Buzz goes wandering out into the night to look for Johnny. He winds up in a bar and he meets Helen. He has no idea who she is, and he goes with her to her bungalow to wait for, well, Helen, before wandering off in his drunken brain-damaged state. Helen calls Harwood and he dumps her, since her husband is back in the picture. She stoops to blackmail, forcing him to visit her one more time. And when he comes to her bungalow, Newell, the hotel detective, notices this. He's always watching. Literally a sketchy pair of unblinking eyes that see all. A massive coincidence happens next, as Johnny is walking down the street in the rain and is picked up by Harwood's wife, Joyce. They don't introduce themselves to each other and keep it all mysterious, but they stay overnight at the same inn and they meet up over breakfast. They make plans to go walking on the beach, but Johnny hears a radio report talking of Helen's death and that he is a person of interest in her murder. So he takes off. That's a pretty big reveal to hear on a random radio broadcast. Yeah, I'll say. I love what a perfect description they had of him, too, considering literally no one saw him after he left Helen's. Everything but his height. Well, Alan Ladd didn't want them talking about his height. Huh. Well, anyway, the police are on the case, and they interview everyone. Newell, Harwood, Buzz, and George. They really want to talk to Johnny, though. How was Harwood just not arrested? Right? Seems like it was pretty open and shut. So Johnny goes and gets checked into the seedy hotel the two sketchy gangster types brought him to, and they wanted to take all his money. But then a policeman showed up to nab the two hoods, and Johnny punched out the hotel manager for threatening to blackmail him. Johnny solves problems with his fists. It's the Johnny way. But in the scrap, the framed photo of his son that Johnny had was broken. And when he inspected the photo, there was a note written on the back by Helen. It basically says that she fears Harwood will kill her, and that Harwood isn't Harwood at all, but a murderer from New Jersey named Bauer. Things are getting needlessly convoluted at this point. The hotel manager calls his other gangster friends, who are also Harwood's partners, and they set up a kidnapping of Johnny. And there is a lot of punching involved. Yeah, but Johnny gets really clobbered this time. Well, they were two fully grown men, and he was only one Alan lad. <laughs> Buzz and George go to confront Harwood at the Blue Dahlia. And they meet Joyce there. And as the music plays, and Joyce plays with a flower, Buzz has a head-pounding flashback of being with Helen and her playing with the flower in the same manner. Johnny escapes and knocks out the two hoods who have him on ice, and when Harwood shows up, he confesses to the murder back in Jersey. One of the crooks wakes up, and another fight breaks out, and this time the crook shoots Harwood, and then Johnny shoots the crook. When on the run and wanted for murder... Always try to leave as many bodies in your wake as possible. That's good advice. Meanwhile, back at the Blue Dahlia, the police have showed up and are working a confession out of Buzz. He can't remember what happened, and it's pretty possible he killed her and blacked out. And yet, we saw Harwood at the murder scene. Johnny shows up and sort of takes over the interrogation. He has the music turned up to get Buzz's head pounding and gives Buzz a pistol to do a trick shot with. Right there in the office. When in doubt, always give the murder suspect a loaded weapon during interrogations. That's like day one of police school. So Buzz somehow is now able to recall that he left Helen alive and well. Newell makes some comment about how maybe George did it and starts to leave. 
And the police are like, aha. And they drop some story about how Newell was trying to blackmail Helen and she wouldn't pay. So he killed her. Newell pulls out his gun and the police shoot him dead. And then George and Buzz go for a drink while Joyce and Johnny canoodle off screen. The end. You know, upon reflection, there was a lot of punching in this movie. I feel like there was a bit of a bait and switch there. Like, I'm not sure the film logically led to that ending. Well, that's what happens when a studio and outside interests demand a writer change the ending of a story. Things can feel a little... Tacked on? A bit, yeah. Okay. Let's prom con this thing. Okay, so as always, we don't actually rate films here on the show. There's no stars. There are no thumbs. We just tell you some things we liked. Some things we didn't. And then we recommend whether or not you might enjoy giving this one a watch. Take it away. My pros. Number one. This movie starts with the pain and trauma and depression and doesn't really let up on it. More than just a film noir, it's a downbeat, sad, and morose tale. Buzz's injury... Johnny's awful homecoming, the reveal of the death of his child, the despair that puts a gun in his hand to point at his wife. And this is all just in the first 20 minutes. Alan Ladd's steely performance is critical here. Being an actor without much emotive range, his steady calmness keeps things from flying off the rails and drowning in its own tears. Number two, there's a lot of silence in this film. There's ambient music when appropriate, but the film lacks a true score. And the effect of this is powerful when powerful lines are delivered. This happens with a special resonance. There's no music guiding the viewer's emotional response. There's just the words, the delivery, the intent of the writer, director, and actors all coming through. It's very effective in such a sad film to deny the audience the joy of music. Number three, Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake are an all-time great screen couple. While not being as iconic, maybe, as Bogart and Bacall or Tracy and Hepburn, Ladd and Lake were seemingly made to make films together. Her sultry and flirty style, her self-satisfied smile, her striking appearance, all paired and juxtaposed with Ladd's constant no-selling and generic handsomeness. They're really wonderful together. My cons. For a movie with a mystery and a bevy of sketchy, suspicious characters, there's not a real tension built around finding out who killed Johnny's wife. We seem to know who did it all along, and it's pretty easy to see that the police aren't likely to catch Johnny. So where's the tension supposed to come from? On what point can we suspend our disbelief enough to think that what seems the most inevitable outcome will not happen? Two, this is a pretty slow film, and giving its depressing subject matter, the combination of slow and depressing leads this to being a movie that can be a bit of a chore to get through. There's just a few too many twists and turns and side roads, and none of them seem to actually speed things along. When the movie has some of its best moments, it's when Johnny and Joyce are together, but the movie doesn't give us enough of that. We have a lot of Alan Ladd rolling around getting into fistfights and getting clonked in the head, But even those all seem more mechanical. They're in the film because they're expected, maybe. Not because they add to the narrative briskness that's required. Number three, the end scene in Hargrove's office at the Blue Dahlia is filled with ridiculousness. First, we have Johnny walking in and giving a murder suspect a loaded pistol. And then we get Buzz firing that pistol, and then the sudden leap of logic by the police to pin the murder on Newell, before a nonsensical shootout ends things. It's like they were trying to do a drawing room murder mystery reveal here. But this film isn't the mousetrap. It's not a whodunit, and the movie never takes us in that direction. What we should have had here was a man-on-the-run kind of movie, accompanied by a will-she-or-won't-she femme fatale. Have his friends searching for him, racing the cops and Harwood, all while Johnny tries to clear his name. But that's not the film we got. Taken as a whole, The Blue Dahlia isn't all that entertaining a film. There are, however, some very entertaining things contained within it. The chemistry between Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake is off the charts. She should have been in this movie a lot more. William Bendix is great, and his shell-shocked character is equal parts amiable and pitiful. We've got some good performances, and a great pair of leads. We just don't have a film that moves with any pace, nor does it commit to the sort of story it wants to be. Is it a tale of revenge? Is it a downbeat return home from the war film? Is it a fugitive story? Is it a whodunit? Actually, is it even a film noir? 
I feel if we look at the characteristics that define a true noir, this film might not make the grade there either. It's a good thing that Lad and Lake made other films together. And that Lad and Bendix made nine others as well. Because this one, I feel like you can probably skip. I know I'm risking treading on some sacred ground here, but this gets a don't watch from me. You're up. Okay, so my pros. One, the different perspectives. Sometimes in a film where characters on the run, like Johnny was, will just follow the protagonist or the police chasing after them, so we only really get to see their take on the events that occur. But in this, we got to see a bunch of different people doing their own things. Johnny on the run, Harwood just being overall sketchy, Buzz and George trying to find Johnny, the police trying to solve the murder. I just thought it was interesting that we got to follow everyone around and see what they were all doing. 2. Veronica Lake. She was really cool. She was really pretty and eye-catching, of course, but she had a unique appearance on screen beyond that. The way that she held herself on camera and delivered her lines gave off a very cool, confident, and intriguing vibe. When she was in a scene, I wanted to watch her and know more about her. She had a strong presence that made it quite enjoyable to watch her in the film. 3. The pacing. It was fine. It was pretty decent throughout the film. Some parts in the middle were rather slow and boring, and I would have wished those were faster. But overall, the film had a rather nice, slow pace that let everything develop without feeling too rushed. Now my cons. 1. Harwood. There were just too many things going on with that guy to make any sort of sense. He's having an affair. Okay. He acts really suspicious after Helen's murder. Fine. We later find out that he did not in fact kill her. But then why did he have people, his weird mob connections, kidnap Johnny? Even if he was a suspect, Harwood probably wouldn't have gotten arrested because he wasn't the murderer. That eventually would have been found out, right? So why risk his innocence just to get to Johnny? And it really seemed like his goons were going to either keep Johnny there or kill him. And why would Harwood try to escape getting arrested for a murder he didn't commit by actually committing a different murder? It made no sense. 2. The female characters. They just weren't written great. Helen was not an enjoyable character to watch at all. And despite Veronica Lake doing her best, Joyce wasn't all too likable either. This film was nominated for an Oscar for Best Screenplay, so why were the female characters so weak and sort of one-dimensional? And even though I'm not a huge fan of her character, I would have loved to see more screen time between Alan Ladd and Veronica Lake. They worked well together and were great on screen, so it would have been awesome if there was more of that. 3. The Ending It was just out of place and didn't make sense. The entire film led us to believe that Harwood killed Helen. All the evidence points to him, he acts really suspicious, it fits. But then Buzz confesses. And then eventually that also makes sense. We saw him come back looking really out of it after meeting Helen, and he's clearly struggling with some form of PTSD from the war. But then he's sort of proven innocent? And then the police officer is just all of a sudden like, I know who did it, and lays these ridiculous theories down about Newell. It seemed like a bit of a leap of logic that he was just immediately able to connect all these invisible dots to find the actual murderer. Overall, I didn't love the film, but there isn't necessarily anything wrong with it. I mean, I will be completely honest, there are parts of it that I just don't remember and are very forgettable for me, but generally, it was good and interesting. I'd probably give it a watch. All right. And with that, we come once again to the end of our episode, and it is not every day where we're split on the recommendation, but there you have it.
this film, it's fair to say, wasn't what either of us were looking for going in. No. But maybe it's one you really like. Have we unfairly come down on a classic or one of your favorites? Let us know all about it in the comments. And I was just going to say check us out next week, but actually... Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, no. Well, do that. Just maybe catch up on some previous episodes you maybe missed, because we do not have a new episode hitting next week. Tell them why. Because you are graduating from high school, and there's also a graduation at my school that I have to do, and uh, it's kind of a busy week. Last week of school, long weekend hitting... Yeah, it's going to be a thing. So, no new episode next week, but we are back with a release on July 7th as we start another month of listener requests. And we are going to start with a bang. Can't wait. It's going to be excellent. But until then, be sure to watch more movies. And spread the word about our show. We're not a secret. You don't have to keep us all to yourselves. So tell your friends. Tell your enemies. You never know. They might like trying to pin a murder on a shell-shocked war veteran as much as you do. Maybe even more. For Sam the Sidekick, I'm Derek, and I love old movies. Additional research for I Love Old Movies, the podcast, is done by Nikki Weatherden. Audio clips come from prefx.co.uk. Images are used through the provisions of fair use, and our theme song, Burning Bridges, is by The Crocs. 